I'm Roy Gallitz. Uh, I just moved here three weeks ago to New York City. It's great being here. And also thanks for, huge thanks for B&H and uh, their event space. Uh, and I came here to talk to you about wildlife photography, the secrets behind the lens. In the last decade, decade and a half even, I've been traveling all over the world from the North Pole to the South, from Kamchatka all the way through Africa to Costa Rica and British Columbia. And all over the world, I was photographing animals. I love photographing animals. And what I saw is something a little bit troubling as well. I saw the animals are struggling. I saw an environment that's changing. And in 2014, it came to me that this thing that you read a lot about in um, the media and the news, this thing called global warming and climate change, are not just two buzzwords you read a lot about and you hear a lot about in the news, or even some people say it's fake. <laughs> but it's happening, and it's real. And thankfully, two and a half years ago, I was honored to become a Greenpeace ambassador and help promote that urging issue of global climate change and animal protection all over the world. So in order to get us into the right state of mind, I want to start off with a short video. A video I took in Tanzania, some of it is from the ground and some of it is with aerial with a drone. So let's watch. Has everyone been here in Tanzania? Oh, yeah, wow, we have a lot of enthusiasts here. Does anybody here, does anyone here like wildlife photography? Do you do wildlife photography? Okay, that's good, that's awesome. So I'm in good company. Yeah, kids are, kids are wildlife, yeah, sure. So it looks like fun, and it usually is, but there are times where it's not fun at all. There are times when I suffer. There are times where I'm at risk. There are times when I miss my kids, my family, my home. One of these times was in 2015. I was in Svalbard, in the high Arctic. And there I was photographing this big mama bear and her two adorable young cubs. And they were pacing towards me like a polar marching band. And I had to capture this insane sight. And they came closer, so close that the only thing logical to do at that point was to shift to vertical mode. Suddenly, I felt a tap on my shoulder. No, it wasn't the bear. 
Okay, but I turned around and saw Tom. Tom had this alarming look on his face, and he said, Roy, we need to leave now. I took my eye out of the viewfinder, only to see that the polar bear mother and her two cubs were just 50 feet away. And that's pretty close to be to, one of, to the world's largest land predator. Okay, more than my comfort zone. So we quickly hopped on our snowmobiles and drove away. And we left all our precious gear behind. That mother and her two cubs came around, played with the gear, and I had nowhere of no way of photographing that because all the gear was left behind. So all I have is a nice memory of that adventure. So as a wildlife photographer, and we, all have, all, we have plenty of wildlife photographers here, uh, I want to talk to you about what <coughs> it means to be a wildlife photographer. A wildlife photographer has to be two things. First part is the outdoors person, the wildlife guy. He needs to be ready to go out there, to go that, that extra mile, to go to the field, to suffer <laughs> if needed, not voluntarily, but if needed. He has to understand the wildlife, know what to predict, how to anticipate, how to keep himself safe or herself. So that's the first part, the outdoors person, the wildlife guy. The second part is the photographer. As a photographer, wildlife photographers have to be very technical. Okay, because if the image is technically not good, it's pretty much unusable. So wildlife photographers have to know a lot about technique. So wildlife photographers, and photographers in general, I think, have what I call, suffer from what I call GUS. It's the gear upgrade syndrome. Okay, it's a chronic <coughs> syndrome, chronic illness, that we all suffer from it. And that syndrome means that if the images are not good, it's not me as a photographer, it's I have a crappy camera <laughs> or a bad lens. And the cure for that is usually getting a new camera or a new lens. And by the way, that's a great place to be at b and for doing that. <laughs> OK, so you're in the right place for the cure. But let me burst some bubbles here. It doesn't matter if you're using Canon or Nikon. You could be using a compact camera and still get excellent results. Sometimes you get even cool photos with our phones, smartphones. Drones are becoming a bigger and bigger part of photography in general, and of course, my own specifically. Even GoPros can provide amazing results. So I can tell you that the most important gear is not the camera or the lens, but it's what's five inches behind the camera. And that's the photographer. You, us. And by the way, that's my third son, Lavi, with his older sibling. <laughs> so we all know who came here first. Okay? So the most crucial part is not the camera, it's the photographer. And that's what I came here to talk with you today. So what makes a good <coughs> wildlife photo? We'll talk about three different aspects. The first and the shortest is the photography part. I will talk to you about composition, technique, and light. And the reason I say it's the shortest part, it's because the, la la the later parts are more crucial. And we'll talk about them as well. But we can't talk about wildlife photography without talking about the photography. First things first, composition. Does anyone know what's composition? What is composition? How you place the object in the... How you place the object in the frame. Yeah, that's right. It's the structure of the image. It's the framing. It's the leading of the eye. It's the rule of thirds. It's diagonal lines. It's the golden ratio. It's so many things, but at the end of the day, it's how I show my photo, how I capture my image. In that case, in this case, what you see here on the screen right now, you see a leopard climbing down a tree. I use the tree trunk and the br two branches as natural framing, to frame the leopard. And you can see the leading of the eye 
from her paw, that's a female, from her paw to her face and eyes. So that's the composition, okay? Um, sometimes I like a more of a minimalistic approach, like this one. Here I was photographing this lioness climbing down the kopje. Kopje is a volcanic rock in Tanzania, <laughs> okay? So while she was climbing down the rock, I took this image. It's a more of a minimalistic kind of, of shot, and I like the op op opposition between the softness and the warmth of the lioness and the hardness and the coldness of the rock itself. Now I'm going to show you one of my favorite birds in the world, the puffin. I love puffins. Sorry. I love puffins. They, for me, they look like a sad clown. Okay, and that's the way I photograph the, the, this guy, because he's about to jump off the cliff. He's a suicidal sad clown. But nobody missed the puffin, I hope so. And not only because it's large in the frame, but also because the puffin is sharp and the background is blurry. The puffin is bright and the background is dark. The puffin is colorful and the background is monochromatic. It's in one shade. Okay, that, these are the tools that I'm using to pull, pull the viewer's attention towards the bird. Next, I photograph the puffin, but in a cooler framing, literally speaking. Here you can see the puffin through a hole in, a, in an iceberg flowing in Jokrusalon in Iceland. So we have that natural framing showing the puffin in its natural surrounding. I was photographing a hummingbird in Costa Rica. I used the branch as natural framing in the, in the shot, and I have the flowers in the bottom right third to complement the hummingbird. I love composition that tells a story. Here you can see the lioness in the upper right third, and the lion is walking towards her, creating a nice diagonal line. Okay, so you can see the diagonal line. He's on the uh, left two-thirds, she's in the upper right third, and this tells a story. He's interested in her, and she's not so interested in him. And a di to a different kind of lion, here's a sea lion, hooker sea lion from New Zealand. Another form of composition, here you can see the young sea lion with his chest up, you know, like uh, imitating his father. And this is a power line. A power line is a strong line in the image which leads the eye of the viewer to where I want it to go. Okay, so in that case, the leading of the eye with the power line is to this climax of the image where the male and the female interact. The next image is a photo I took of Penn Station in rush hour. <laughs> no, actually it's not Penn Station, no, that's in South Georgia, exactly. So these are the king penguins. And I love to photograph patterns and abstracts. But when I photograph patterns, I always make sure I have a solid base to the frame. In this case, I used the youngsters or the young penguins, the brown one. Usually the older ones just chase them out of the colony just to keep some quiet and peace to themselves, okay, like all parents. So these guys, I uh, just, just had a huge fight. No, just kidding. Uh, so they, they, I like the opposite composition, opposing composition. These are bee eaters from Uganda. Another storytelling is these guys. These guys. Here you can see a male Magellanic penguin from the Falkland Islands. And on the left you see two females, and they are actually gossiping on the guy on the right. Again, so that's kind of a story that the composition creates. In some cases, the majority of my image is blurry, like this one. That's a leopard climbing down a tree in Tanzania. And you can see the majority of the image is blurry, but that helps the leopard to stand out in the frame and, of course, enhances its presence. One of my favorite shapes in composition is triangles. These guys are having a licking party in the reign of the savannah. And actually this licking party is when they drink the water, the rainwater, off each other's fur. So the reason I like the triangles, triangle shapes, 
is because its the diagonal lines are very appealing to the eye. So triangles are two, two diagonals which interact. And actually, that's a very rare photo, because you see here a mother, cheetah, with her four grown-up cubs. They are two years old, and that's extremely rare, because 95.2% of cheetah cubs won't make it to the age of two. So a mother with four cubs, actually, that's, that means she's an amazing mother. Amazing mother, protecting her from all, all harms that can happen in the savannah. Another example of a triangle is this lady. That's a spirit bear from B British Columbia. Actually, her name is Ma'a. Ma'a, in the Gitkat tongue, Gitkat is the First Nation uh, people living there, Ma'a means grandmother. And she is one of the oldest bears in the forest. She's 18 years old, and she has a lot of grandchildren running around in the forest. So that's why they called her grandmother. And now to a more complex composition is this guy. That's an elephant I photographed. And you see the upper third of the frame is the canopy of the tree, the entire upper third of the frame. The right third of the frame, I have the trunk of the tree. Here I have another acacia tree, just to uh, complete the look of the cut off tree on, on top. And here I have an elephant creating an opposite S line. With the, uh, with the sand that he's throwing on himself. So that's also a more complex kind of composition. And I love S shapes, like this one. You can see the S shape of the composition, and that's uh, Susus Vle, a lot of S's, uh, in Namibia. And that S shape, shape creates a very nice leading of the eye. And just to get a uh, perspective of the size of this dune, I have three trees and an oryx. OK, so because you have to have an oryx in Namibia, in, <laughs> in every photo. OK, so we talked about composition. Let's run forward and talk about technique. When I'm talking about technique, I mean operating the camera. I mean um, light metering, focusing, shutter, speed, ISO, and everything involving operating the camera. So in that case, I use spot metering, spot metering, just a little bit off the sun to get this young giraffe in silhouette. Another story is when I was driving in Tanzania, in the Serengeti, and I saw a group of vultures flying, circling around, and coming down. Do you know what that means? Dead. Sorry? Something's dead. Something's dead, yes. There's a carcass, a dead animal. Pizza, I don't know. Something that's tasteful downstairs. So they're flying down. I told my driver, Dale, let's go over there, see what's going on. And indeed, we saw a carcass of an impala. At that point, I had to decide what I'm going to do. So we located ourselves 10 meters, 30 feet away from the carcass, while the wind was blowing from behind me towards the carcass. <coughs> Two advantages. The first, I don't smell the carcass, which smells terrible. Second advantage is that vultures must land against the wind and not with the wind. In that case, they can only come in my direction. There is no other option. So all I, all I had to do is point my camera, wait for the vultures to come, and then just click, 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 they landed. Another one, click, 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 it landed. And so on and so on. At the end of the day, all I had to do is choose my favorite one. So it's very easy photographing a vulture landing. Just set the camera on autofocus, continuous, if you're using Nikon or AI server, if you're one of the Canon guys or girls. And, and that's it. Very easy. One of the toughest birds to photograph flying is actually my favorite one, which is the puffin. Exactly. Puffins, I don't know if you noticed, but they don't really fly. They more or less crash. <laughs> OK? So instead of doing this nice, smooth motion, 
my motion, my movement was something like this. Okay? When I was shooting off the cliff in Latraberg in Iceland. Out of a hundred photos, almost all of them were blurry, unfocused. The puffing was cut off. Some of them didn't even have a puffing in them. I'm sorry to admit. But I only need how many? One. That's all I need. So was it worth the try? Yes, of course. I only need one. So with digital, it's easy. Photograph more, choose later. So that's a, a puffing from Iceland. And that's a uh, tufted puffing from Kamchatka in eastern Siberia. He has these blonde stripes. Speaking of technique, sometimes I like to use slow shutter speeds. With slow shutter speeds, I can get some motion blur. Like in this case, when I photographed this northern fulmar in, in Svalbard, and you can see the water spray smearing from the bird. You can see the movement of the wings. That's thanks to the slow shutter speed. In another example, I was photographing a bear shaking. In this case, it looks even cooler. Of course, it looks better than I would have photographed it frozen, solid, sharp. Another example is Ma'a. Remember Ma'a? Grandmother? So here she is walking near the waterfall. And I use the slow shutter speed to get that motion blur on the waterfall. So it looks more uh, uh, silky. OK? Sometimes I use a fast shutter speed to freeze the frame. In this case, you can see the Adelie penguin jumping from one piece of ice to another. So that's, about that's all I wanted to, to share with you now about technique. Let's go forward because we have so much to talk about. Let's go straight ahead to light. Light is the, the, the infrastructure of photography. It's our main uh, ingredient. The word itself, photography, photo means light. Graphic means writing. So all the camera does, it record reflected light of objects. When the light is good, the photo is good. When the light is bad, the photo is bad. I think one of the th main things about photographers that I like is that photographers can see the light. If you're, if you're speaking to a person or you walk down the street and you see this amazing light, you feel pleased. You can talk to someone and say, oh my god, there's such an amazing light on you. Well, people who don't understand photography usually don't even notice that. That's another layer of life, light. So in this case, I was photographing a water buck, a water buck. And the sun was setting from the west, from the left, illuminating the water buck, while a big tree casted a huge shadow on the bush behind the water buck. That's why the background is dark. It looks almost as if it was shot in a studio. One of my favorite lighting of all is backlight. In this case, it's back and left. The, the advantage of this light is that you can see the layers on this polar bear. OK, you see the layers? Can you see them? Great. These layers give me depth to the image, to the subject. But in order to get a good depth perception, I have to have a dark background. OK, for example, here you can see the polar bear marching with her two cubs, the ones that we talked about before. The cubs are with bright background. That's one of the reasons they come out almost as silhouettes, while the bear is with a dark background. And this way, I can see those layers I was talking to you about before. Here you can see, see a completely backlight, complete backlight, and you see the contour lines of the polar bear marching in the fjord. Another example in black and white, even stronger contour lines, you can see just the lines. That's what I wanted to emphasize, and that's why I changed it, I converted it to black and white. OK? Can you guess what animal is this? That's a baby cheetah. That's a baby cheetah. 
I love baby cheetahs. First of all, I love cheetahs. I love baby cheetahs because of that plumage they have on their back. That's actually for camouflage. I've been told it makes them look like honey badgers, and then lions don't, don't, charge, don't attack them. But that's a, a, hypo a hypothesis. So here you can see the baby cheetah running with the backlight in the, in the sunrise in the Serengeti. And that's a family of cheetahs enjoying the sunset in the Serengeti, looking at the last rays of light. Another example is this family of bears. It was a very heavy, cloudy day, overcast day. And all of a sudden, the sun came out of the clouds, illuminating just them like in theater. So it came out pretty nice. That's whopper swans in Hokkaido, in Japan, last February. And in all of the images I've shown you now, the common factor is that the sun is not in the frame. If I have the sun in the frame, what will happen? Silhouette. Or silhouette or blown out background. That's right. OK, so I prefer to work with silhouettes. And usually, for those kinds of images, for these kinds of images, I have the soundtrack from The Lion King in the background. You know, the ah, Tiguanya. So I have that every morning in Tanzania, just when the sun rises. If I don't have that song, the sun doesn't rise. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it, it could be cloudy. The good thing about silhouette, the key factor about silhouette, is to have a distinctive line of the animal. In this case, not only is it easy to recognize which animal this is, but you can even recognize the sex, the gender of the animal. Okay, so a key to a good silhouette is having good contour lines. Another cool photo is this one, sunrise in Serengeti. You can see a group of hyenas eating a uh, gnu, a wildebeest. In the background you have another gnu, and in the sky you have a vulture flying. That's again, a crazy sunrise. One of the most amazing sunsets I've ever seen was in Antarctica. It was 11.30 p.m., and the sun was setting over the horizon. Just as the sun was getting lower, I had a cloud casting a shadow over, a, over an iceberg. I ran inside, my camera was on the couch inside the boat. I ran back out and photographed it, and it was crazy. This iceberg was huge. Just to get a proportion of scale, you see those little pixels from that distance, I guess? Those are penguins. And this iceberg is 500 feet tall. And as they say, it's just the tip of the iceberg. OK? In recent years, we see more of, more of these huge icebergs floating in the oceans around Antarctica as the ice shelf is carving. And that's because of the warming seawater. So we're done talking about the photography part. Now let's talk about the wildlife part. And that's, I think, more interesting and more important to create a good wildlife photo, the wildlife. We'll talk about portrait, environmental portrait, behavior, and emotion. What is a portrait? Come on. What's a portrait? A face? Not just a face. A Not just a headshot. Otherwise, my passport photo would be a portrait, and it's not. Not just a story. A portrait is a photo, for me, for me, a portrait is a photo which conveys the character of your subject, the essence of your subject. That's what a good portrait does. OK? And there's a saying. What is the, the window to the soul? Eyes. The eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul. Exactly. Uh, in one of my uh, expeditions to Costa Rica, I met this tiny frog called red eye tree frog. What's the key uh, characteristic of the red eye tree frog? Red eyes. red eyes. That's good. You're sharp. OK. Red eyes. So this frog is about two inches big, 
I'm trying to get closer with the 105 macro lens. And when I get closer to the, to the frog, the frog lips on my lens and crashes on the front of it. So like, getting closer, then I got pow. So again, we have this game, me and the frog. I need to get closer and manage to be in focus and photograph before the frog lips on my lens. So it took me 20 minutes until I finally got this shot. But that's a nice <coughs> portrait of a frog. And you can see the, the red eyes. So it, it was worth it. One of my favorite portraits is of one of my favorite sea mammals, and that's the walrus. Walruses are awesome. Okay, so they're really underappreciated, and I think every every time I see a walrus, I, I smile. Okay, so this guy, this is a portrait of a walrus, and you can see its character. He's big, he's heavy, he's massive, he's the king of the beach, and nothing is going to move him away. Okay, even has this, you know, the folding lines when you bend over. <laughs> okay, he has a suit maybe too big for him. In the right third of the image, you can notice in the background, I photographed this driftwood, this log. And I'm saying something. This was not an accident that I placed it inside the frame. I'm saying something. I'm comparing the walrus and the tree log. I'm saying they are both the same. They are both massive, and no one's going to move them. OK, so that, that's a statement. Another instance was when I was, again, in Costa Rica, I saw baby turtles hatching from their nest, baby <coughs> sea turtles. And I got on the ground. I laid on the, on the sand. I got my 105 millimeter Nikon and waited for one of them to come out. And this little turtle, the first thing, first thing he saw in this world was my lens. So he looks a little bit in shock. <laughs> OK? But in return, I made sure the seagulls won't eat him on the way to the ocean. OK, so that's what, that was a good deal. Now look at this guy. There's a saying, famous saying by Ansel Adams. He said, in every photo, there are two persons, the photographer and the viewer. What did I feel? What did I feel when I took this image? Exactly. I felt dark, mysterious, maybe even evil. I took it on purpose. I photographed it on purpose, underexposed. I focused only on the eye. Nothing mm. else matters. Only the eye and its reflection. And that's how I felt when I photographed this caiman. What did I feel with this guy? Exactly. Oh, he's so adorable. Oh my god. I just love him. I love him. That's a, a Arctic fox pup in Svalbard in the, in the high Arctic. So I love these guys. And that's the way I photographed him. Very bright image, very soft, very nice colors, pastel colors. He looks very, very sweet. And that's how I feel for him. And what did I feel with this guy? Exactly, he's sad. He's walking, he's wet from the morning dew in the grass. And I have this nice side light on this little guy, as well as this little guy, this baby lion. But look at his father. Now, that's a portrait of a lion showing its essence, its character, and that that's what, that's what makes a good portrait, as well as this guy from Japan. That's a Japanese snow monkey. And they are very expressive. I love the family photos as well. I love also newborn photos. See the mother with her baby. And this is the wise guy, the wise person of the tribe. One of the funniest animals, funniest portraits, is the slowest mammal on Earth, which is the sloth. the sloth, exactly. So look at his, his portrait. That's 
his character. Okay, he's chill back, okay, he's relaxed. Dude, what's the matter? What's the rush? Don't worry about it. It's all good. So he's relaxed, sitting like in a human posture on the branch, okay, with his knees bent, his eyes shut, and he has this dreamy smile as well. And by the way, do you see the green on his fur? That's algae, exactly. That's algae. And that provides him camouflage, which is amazing that he has algae growing on his fur. And do you know how the algae get there? He has moths, a moth, moths, plural, living inside his fur. Like, if you shave one of them, you'll, get, you'll see five or ten moths. So they transfer the algae from one to the other. So that's an amazing animal. It's an entire ecosystem on one animal that doesn't move so much. And this guy is actually, I'm kind of joking about him in this photo. That's an impala. And the impala is known as the fast food of Africa. And you know how you can tell it's a fast food? Because he has McDonald's sign on his rear. OK, again, that is just a joke. He's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, I love impalas. So we talked about portraits and about the character of the animals. Now let's talk about environmental portraits. Environmental portraits, in opposed to portraits, environmental portrait is a portrait showing the animal in its natural surrounding, with its environment. That's why it's called an environmental portrait. In this case, you can see the African elephant. It's the largest land mammal on Earth. But still, it's a dot on the Serengeti in the huge plains around it. But you can see in the sky, I have a lot of elephants. So that's the composition, if we take you back to that part of the, of the talk. That's an environmental portrait. Here you can see king penguins in their natural habitat. So it's not just penguin portrait that you see, but it's a portrait of a penguin with its entire surroundings. Here you can see the king of the Arctic, the polar bear. And the next image I'm going to show you is actually, actually one of my favorites. I called it Dreaming of Sea Ice. Here you can see a polar bear. Oops, it didn't change. Here you can see a portrait of a bear, an environmental portrait of a bear, sleeping tight on the one, of the, no, one of the last sea ice in Svalbard for the season. OK, so you can see him resting sound. He's sleeping very deeply. And he has actually two bodyguards, one on land and one airborne. And polar bears really rely on sea ice to survive. And polar bears without sea ice can't hunt. And that's why they're starving. In all of these journeys, expeditions, I don't sleep in five-star hotels. Usually, I sleep in a million-star hotel, like this one. By the way, in the right third, you can see the Milky Way. And here is another example from Dedzle in Namibia. So we talked about portraits, we talked about environmental portraits. Now let's talk about behavior. Behavior is the holy grail of wildlife photography. That's what the uh, photo editors are looking for. That's what the competition judges are looking for. And of course, that's what photographers, wildlife photographers, are looking for. Behavior creates a story within the view a viewer's mind. And I don't care if the story that you make for yourself is that these guys are yawning or roaring. It doesn't matter as long as there is a story. The story increases our involvement with the photo. And when I have a good story, a good photo, a good behavior, that photo will stand out for many others. I like to photograph animals with food. You can see here a li young lion playing around with a spring hair, like as if it was a rag doll. OK, speaking of not playing with your food. Here you can see a leopard on a tree. And if we speak about the portrait part, or about the behavior part of the portrait, 
what is she doing? That's a female as well. She's licking her, her lips. She, it's, it's tasteful for her. She likes it. So it's interesting. It's, cr it's creating a story. Or this guy, this female, feeding a chick. That's a, that's a gentoo penguin in Antarctica. And in that case, it looks very relaxed and peaceful. But actually, I can tell you it was a blizzard from hell. OK, it was minus 5 degrees centigrade, whatever that's in Fahrenheit. That's cold. <laughs> OK? And the wind was blowing at uh, 20, 30 meters per second, which is a lot. So the, the snow actually was blowing sideways, not down. OK? So that's what, that was a very tough situation to photograph there. OK, a bear with a sockeye salmon fish. OK, you can see the bear is pretty satisfied. Uh, the fish isn't. Last year, when I was in Svalbard, I was photographing a polar bear who was pretty skinny. And he had to go for snacks, like here. You see the polar bear with a barnacle goose chick in its mouth. And that's pretty rare. They don't usually go for baby geese because there's no, there's no calories in it. They just go for bigger animals like seals. One of the craziest scenes I've ever witnessed was last March. Last March, I was in Tanzania. I woke up in the morning early, of course, before sunrise, got out in the, in the jeep, went out to the field, and I saw a pride of lions laying on the, on the ground with their bellies full. What does that mean? They just ate. They had a big dinner or breakfast or all through the night. So I was standing, looking around. Where, where was the carcass? What did they eat? I couldn't find anything. And I'm waiting for three, four minutes. And that's a lot of time for a hyperactive guy. OK? So I'm waiting, and nothing happens. Suddenly, one of the young ones, like young lions, get up, gets up. He walks like 20 feet stops, looks at me like, hey, man, why aren't you coming? And he walked inside the bush. Of course, I couldn't drive inside the bush, so I told the driver, the guide, let's go around. So we drove around the bush, and what I saw there amazed me. What I saw is this. Yeah, that's crazy. The baby lion was eating the head of an elephant. OK? Crazy. And this guy later posed for about half an hour in different poses, which was insane. By the way, this elephant, I made sure, he died of natural causes. So it wasn't poached or anything. He, he was just sick. Animals die. OK, that's part of, war, of part of wildlife. So in that case, nothing goes to waste. Yeah, you can grab a seat. We already started. And I hope you don't mind. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, Whopper Swan landing in Hokkaido in the winter. Here you can see a leopard seal yawning. And by the way, I love its teeth. Its teeth are so amazing and complex. And the next guy I'll show you, the next photo I'll show you, is for me a sign of determination. OK, this guy was charging at the fish, at the salmon, endlessly. It, every minute it would charge, every three minutes it would catch a fish, and this guy didn't stop eating. So that's determination to you. Here you can see a mountain gorilla having a salad and a lemur in shock. <laughs> Looks like, a, oh my god, it's Monday already? <laughs> I love small animals because they are always cute, like this guy enjoying a snack. That's a ground squirrel in Russia. The next image I'm going to show you is a behind-the-scenes kind of look. Here you can see 
me as I'm guiding a workshop for photographers, and we are next to a pool. And this pool lays the most dangerous mammal in Africa to humans, which is hippos, exactly, hippos. And now I'm going to give you a word of advice, safety tip if you'd like. Okay, you can see me here, and whenever you're photographing a dangerous animal, always make sure there is someone in front of you. <laughs> okay, that's safety. No, you're just kidding, of course. But thanks to being patient and low and waiting for the right moment, <coughs> I managed to get this behavior. And that's, let's say, a portrait, behavioral portrait of a hippo. That's the way hippos are. I love to play, to photograph uh, baby animals fighting. Okay, they remind me of my own kids. I've got four boys. Okay, so I love to photograph baby animals fighting. You can see how the right one is blessing the left one. And it, th so that's how it looks like in Africa, and that's how it looks like in the high Arctic, in Svalbard, with Arctic pups, Arctic fox pups. So here they're playing, here they're playing catch. This is in Kamchatka, a little bit of romance, play fight. And here's when things got a little bit more intense. And that's romantic. I love to photograph courtship, like this guy. Here you can see jackals in Africa. And you see a male jackal, a female jackal, and an agama lizard. <coughs> okay, yeah, what does the lizard do there? Well, the male shows the female the lizard, and then he goes like, look, lizard, 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 throws the lizard away. The female goes and picks up the lizard while the male comes and, and mounts her. Okay? Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, sure, they are, sure does. They did it 15 times. <laughs> okay, so that's how courtship looks like. That's another behavior. And of course, you can't talk about behavior and courtship without talking about mating. So here you can see lions mate. And this photo I took with a 24 millimeter lens, okay, as an environmental portrait, behavioral portrait. So I want to show not only the lion and lioness mating, but I want to show their entire surroundings, the savanna, the, the plains of the Serengeti, and of course, the amazing African sky. And that's how it looks like in Tanzania, and that's how it looks like in South Georgia. So here again, you can see the male, the female, and here you have the curious cousin. <laughs> okay? So it's all normal. So that, these, these are be different behaviors. And the next behavior I'm going to show you is something a little bit more extreme. When life is in danger. I was photographing, you remember the mother and four cubs enjoying the sunset in the Serengeti? with the backlight, all of a sudden, a hyena, hyena came, the hyena came, and he tried to kill the cubs. The mother was very brave and attacked the hyena. So that was pretty crazy. And also, also some great light. <laughs> okay, and the next image I'm going to show you it's a photo that also won several international awards. Uh, I called it Run for Your Life. So what you're seeing here is, again, behavior, but the peak of evolutionary behavior between life and death. And let me tell you, one of them didn't make it. So here you can see the gazelle running as fast as she can. That's a female. Uh, you have four legs in the air. You have four legs in the air of the cheetah. Look at the gazelle's face. She's panicked. Well, you can understand why. And look at the cheetah's face. She's concentrated 110%. And one more thing I want to show you here. And that's this rock. The rock was kicked by the gazelle, almost hit the cheetah in the face, missing it by inches. And the cheetah just ran under the rock. The rock was in the air, just up and down. Cheetah was running below it. 
So we talked about behavior, let's go forward and continue to talk about emotion. And when I talk emotion, I just I don't, don't necessarily mean the emotion that the animal has, but also the emotion it triggers with the viewer, with you. Okay? So when you're seeing this baby cheetah kissing its mother on the forehead, okay? It touches you somewhere. And that's what I'm trying to do. So that's how it is with the cheetah and cubs, and that's how it is with the lioness and two-week-old baby lions. And they're still blind, helpless, and their mother is taking care of everything they need. In this case, she's cleaning them. I love the connection between cub and mother. Sorry, dads. Dads are usually out of the photo <coughs> in wildlife. Okay, so usually the males leave the females. So it's always with a female. Uh, so I love to show the connection. And here you can see the baby bear and how he loves its mother and how his mother loves him. Here you can see the same with the Japanese snow monkeys, with this intimate look. Sometimes it's not love, but more panic. Here you can see the little, ba little baby monkey panicked over a male that tried to attack it. When they're teenagers, teenagers act differently. They're not interested in the mother anymore, but food. In this case, in this case, this baby bear just wants the fish. It doesn't care about the mother. What do you feel with this one? What does it make you feel? Curious, curious exactly. He is, he's in his playground, and cubs are really curious. OK, you can see he's even sticking his tongue out. Also here, the same curiosity coming into play. It's like to be or not to be, but with a fish head. I love the connection between the animal and the viewer. And so when the animal is looking in the lens, later it lo it's looking at the viewer's eyes. In this case, you can see the mountain gorilla. And she has, he has this most amazing human look. Sometimes the emotion, hey, you can come sit here if you want. It's okay, it's okay. We see you. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes the emotion is not necessarily of love or affection. Sometimes it can be humor, like this guy. <laughs> Hysterical ground crow. Or uh, this hyena who just heard a joke and rolling on the floor with laughter. I photographed uh, Japanese snow monkeys. And as we know, monkeys can imitate. So this guy was imitating me photographing him. <laughs> so I guess this is how I look when I photograph. <laughs> Later on, I was photographing this spaceman. So he has like a space suit. I love cute animals, like this blonde fur seal. I was photographing her for half an hour. She was posing in so many different amazing postures. But then she got tired and went to bed. <laughs> but the funniest animal of them all, for me, is the elephant seal. Elephant seals are hilarious. They have this human-like face, but they're doing all those different funny faces. <laughs> the next photo I'll show you, I called it the three tenors. <laughs> That's how they sounded, yeah. OK? Pavarotti and the other two. <laughs> so we talked about photography. We talked about the wildlife. As photographers, we always try to show something unique. And the uniqueness can come in different forms. It can be the, the photo itself. It can be the composition. It can be the behavior. It can be the subject. So we're trying to, to, to show animals out of their element. OK, like this vegetarian lion from Tanzania. Or dolphins surfing the waves in New Zealand. That's hectodolphins. I can photograph birds sitting on rocks. Or I can photograph them flying among the stars. And the stars here are actually 
the sun being reflected off the water of the fjord behind the bird. I can photograph reflections like here, with a polar bear being reflected off the water and the ice in Svalbard. And if you ask people what is the crucial ingredient of being a wildlife photographer, a lot of the times they will say, patience. Exactly, patience. Okay, patience is crucial with wildlife photography because I can tell you that things never happen when I want them to happen. Things happen when they need to happen. 99% of the times I look like this. Nothing's happening, my camera is pointing down and I'm waiting for something interesting. Most of the time I'm not photographing. I'm watching, I'm learning, I'm trying to understand in order to predict the decisive moment. Now you all know the term decisive moment. The decisive moment is that instance where all the elements of the frame come together to be in their perfect spot. That's the decisive moment. Sometimes I can predict and know when it's going to be, but sometimes I can't predict it. So what do I do when I don't know when the decisive moment will come? Exactly. I, sh I shoot in continuous mode, exactly. I shoot in continuous mode because it's a lot easier erasing photos after than taking photos you've missed, which is impossible usually with wildlife, okay? So I'll show you now an example. Here, I'll show you a sequence of the clicking of the camera. Click, 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 as I was photographing the chase of the cheetah after the gazelle. So the cheetah is running as fast as she can. Okay, you can see the click, 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 and then she chooses the weakest gazelle. She runs as fast as she can. She's trying to get closer and closer, and they both run at the maximum speed, when suddenly the gazelle kicked the rock which almost hit the cheetah in the face. As I told you, missed it by inches as the cheetah was running under it. That's the photo I showed you before. And the cheetah is getting closer and closer until finally she reaches her front paw, knocking the gazelle over. And here it was almost done, but the gazelle doesn't give up. She gets up and keeps running. And then she kicks the cheetah in the jaw, which takes the cheetah a couple of seconds to recover. And then the chase continues. And they're going back and forth back and forth, and no one gives up until finally the cheetah gets a firm grip on the gazelle. Then comes a quick twist, and it's all over. What I showed you now is a sequence showing 13 seconds in real life. OK? 13 seconds, after which I can choose my favorite images, like the one I showed you before, or this one here. So that's when I don't know the exact decisive moment. I shoot continuous, I aim for the fastest frame rate, as many frames per second as possible, pray to God my buffer <laughs> won't fill up, okay? And then I choose afterwards, in hindsight. So. But a lot of the times, I can know, I can tell when the decisive moment is going to be. Because one behavior leads to another. So let's talk about the lion's mating from before. Lion's mating isn't that interesting, unless you're into that kind of thing. But I don't judge, OK? But lion's mating isn't interesting. What's interesting is what comes next. OK, what comes next, do you know? No, they're not hugging. <laughs> they will fight. She will attack him, exactly. The female will attack the male. And the reason she will attack him is because the male has spines on his genital, and when he gets out of the female, it scratches her from inside, which, of course, is aimed to increase chances of ovulating and, and increase the chances of pregnancy, of course. But what in, what's important for us is that the female will attack the male. And then you'll get something like this. But don't worry, if you've missed it, they'll do it again in 15 minutes. 
<laughs> okay, because lion, lions mate four times an hour. And they do it 24 hours a day. And they do it for five to seven days. So if you've missed it, you've got a lot of other opportunities to capture. And that's why it's super easy to photograph something like that as long as you're there while they're mating. So as I said, one behavior leads to another. If you see a bear, a bear walking down the stream to a, towards another bear, and he's doing like this with his head, you know what's going to happen? Exactly, there's going to be a fight. And that's when you get something like that. But you have to be ready. You need to see the telltale signs, and then you know what to predict. When an animal goes out of the water, what does it do? Shakes. Good demonstration. Yeah, it shakes, and then you get images like that. When you're, photogra when you're photographing a chase, when you're photographing a chase, you never focus on the one being chased. Only the chaser is the one you're focusing at. And the reason is that the one being chased, I have no idea where it's going to go. But the chaser, where is it going to go? After the one being chased, of course. So I know how to predict where it's going to go. One of those examples is when I was in Manyara in Tanzania, I saw a baby baboon, baby baboon, running towards an alpha male. He ran towards him, did like, pew, gave him a slap, and ran away. OK, I knew what was going to happen. So I just, all I had to do is aim my camera at the, at the alpha male, see where the baby is running, it was jumping from one branch to the other, and then I could catch this image as the alpha male was chasing the baby. She was teaching him a lesson. Okay, so I know what to predict, and so on. Here is a, a crocodile charging at the Nile, or a, a walrus going into dive brown skewer attacking king penguins. And this one is actually one of my favorite. That's an ivory gull. Ivory gulls, I, I call actually I call this image Arctic Angel. I love ivory gulls because ivory gulls follow polar bears. Okay, so a lot of the time when I'm looking for polar bears, I'm actually looking for ivory gulls. So people are, I'm looking for polar bears and the people I'm guiding in the workshop asking, why are you looking for bears there? OK, I'm not looking for the bears there in the, in the sky. I'm looking for the ivory gulls, because these guys feed on the feces of the bear. <laughs> so it's um, kind of a low food for an angel, yeah, but they're, they're beautiful birds. Now I'm going to show you several uh, uh, decisive moments with one species of bird. So this is an arctic tern, arctic tern. Here you can see the arctic tern entering the water to get food. Here's, here it's getting out of the water. That's another decisive moment. Courtship, another decisive moment. The result of the courtship, another decisive moment, and so on. Okay, so decisive moment after decisive moment, and that's how you get beautiful decisive moment results, beautiful behavior photos. Here you can see a glacier collapsing, carving, with all the birds flying in the air or a dusky dolphin jumping out of the water. So these are all decisive moments. One of the famous sayings in photography is by uh, Robert Kappa said, if your pictures are not good enough, it means you're not close enough. You, you know that saying, yeah? You know that phrase. So because I think my images are not as good as it can be, because nothing is ever as good as it can be, I'm trying to listen to him and get closer. So I'm getting closer and closer and closer. Sometimes it's easy, like with penguin. What's the worst they're going to do? Peck at my shoe. OK, so that's easy. But with other animals, it's a lot more challenging, like with this pelican flying in the fog. OK, another example is with this mama bear. So I'm kind of close, and in order f to make her look bigger than she is, I was photographing from ground level. So when you photograph from something from low to, the, to up, from low to higher angle, then the animal or the person or the subject will look a lot bigger than it is. So you're looking at it like, like a child is looking at a parent. 
Okay, so it looks a lot more impressive. So in this case, I'm photographing from the ground level upwards, and then you see the bear in this strong, impressive posture. For shooting from a low angle can also be shooting in eye level, like here, when this brown bear was charging at a salmon fish in Lake Kuril in Kamchatka. Behind the scenes, it looks something like this. So that's me. I'm in the water. The water is just a bit over freezing temperature, but I'm not getting wet. And the reason is I'm using waders. You know, waders are fishermen's pants. OK, so it's completely waterproof, unless sometimes I lean too much forward. OK, but usually it's waterproof. And then that keeps me dry. Cold, but dry. So that's a big part of my photography gear. You, you wouldn't think of waders as part of your photography gear, but it absolutely is. So look at, let's look at this image. This image was shot with a 24 to 70 millimeter lens, Nikon f2.8. And I'm shooting again from a low angle to get this result. And it looks a lot more impressive rather than if I were backwards using a telelens. OK, or these guys. These are walruses. And here again, I'm close. I'm using a 24 millimeter lens in order to get this perspective. If I would shoot from back further away and use a large telephoto lens, all I would get is one of these guys and a little bit of ice behind it. But thanks to the fact that I'm getting closer and using a wider angle, instead of getting this narrow angle, I'm getting closer and I'm seeing the animal and all its surroundings. So now it's not a portrait, it's an environmental portrait. But the animal is look, it looks really impressive. So you can see the entire fjord surrounding it. Another example, here I'm even closer, in order to get this kind of shot. Another example is with these guys, brown bears. Now, brown bears can be dangerous, OK? Again, so all of the images I'm showing you here, don't try this at home. OK, please, don't try this at home. It took me a decade to start getting closer. OK, don't try this at home, not with walruses, not with bears. Try to use telelens. If you want to do it closer, you have to do it correctly, patiently. And don't do any, anything stupid. Let's be clear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was somebody took a picture of you. Yeah. and I was thinking being in the midst of all those bears, okay. Like now obviously you had somebody there taking yeah. a picture with it, so you were not alone. No. Uh, so I uh, the question is and I think for the people online because you can't hear you because I'm with the mic. Uh he was asking uh, the, what's your name? John. John was asking that I was with the bears, and there was someone else photographing me. And I was pretty close to the bears and surrounded with bears. So I can tell you a few things. The person who was photographing me is someone from the workshop I was guiding. I'm guiding photography workshops in many places around the world. So the person taking a photo is one of the, uh, of the clients who traveled with me to that place. That place is in Kamchatka, in southern, southern Kamchatka. Uh, and I'll only be so close to bears in that place, not in any other. Because in that place, I'll show you later, the bears have so much salmon that they don't really care for people. Elsewhere, that would be, th this image would be suicidal. <laughs> okay? I would not try this nor recommend this to anyone. Okay? Plus, I had a, a Russian local inspector from the Russian office. And he had a flare gun just in case. So he, was, he had my back. So it, it wasn't completely uh, careless. OK, you can say that. Uh, and again, I've been there 
so many times. So I already know how to predict. And you know, some bears can be dangerous, some bears are not. This guy, this guy over here behind me, that's a dangerous alpha male. I would never get close to this guy. Okay? So uh, with alpha males, I usually I just go backwards and I, I don't get any closer than necessary. So but you obviously had somebody there with yeah, you. Well, I had the people I was guiding the workshop, yeah. I had, I had people guiding the workshop and I had a local inspector. Okay, but again, don't try this at home. So, uh, yeah, I'm photographing the bears there. And again, that's a very distinct situation. Not the rule, the exception. Okay? So you have to be at the right place, not just go for any bear in the world and just go, hi, bear. Okay? With the bear or with any other animal. Or with any other animal. It can be dangerous. Yeah. So again, don't try this at home. I, I know where I'm doing and what I'm doing. And again, I'm here. So never been in danger. People always ask me, were you ever attacked? I said, never. Were you ever close to being attacked? I was never close to being attacked. I was never in danger in any form. And when I approached the walruses before, I showed you the, 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 these amazing guys, OK? I, I would never approach them. And again, it took me seven years and thousands of walruses until I got these clothes. So I would never approach a walrus that didn't want me near it. I've had walruses, and you communicate with the animal. Not, not like Dr. Doolittle communicates, but you communicate with the animal. So when you're getting close, you, you, you notice its reaction. If the animal is stressed, I would never go further. I would either freeze and wait and see if it relaxes. And if the animal doesn't relax, I would just crawl backwards. These guys, after six others that I tried to approach, and they were nervous. And I don't want to harass the animals. I don't want to stress the animals. And of course, I don't want the animals to feel like they're in danger. Otherwise, I'll be in danger. OK? And we don't want that, <laughs> especially since the nearest hospital is two days of sailing away. OK? And there is no cellular connection, of course, only satellite phone. So whenever a walrus is going like, like this, it doesn't want me near it. I crawl backward. I don't even get up. I crawl backward, not to harass it. Okay, okay, big fellow, that's all right. I'm going elsewhere. Don't worry about it. That's fine. Try to approach another one. If it's fine, I'll get closer. If not, I won't. So again, there is a lot of knowledge and planning and practice and experience going coming into play here. It's not just, hi, Warworth, I'm here. Okay, or bear or any other animal. Yeah. I'm, um, I, I can ask that as questions at, at the end of the talk, if you'd like. So um, photographing the, the, these bears, I'm trying to get closer, closer and closer. But again, I have this Sergei. Sergei is the local inspector. And he's the one telling me where this has to end. That's the closest I can get. Because Sergei is a very experienced guy. He's been with the bears in the, for the last five years. He knows each and every bear by name. He knows this guy is crazy, don't go near him. This girl, this female, she's very patient. No worries about it. Okay, so that's how I usually walk. Because I don't pretend to know each and every bear. And of course not as well as Sergei does. Okay, lo trust the local specialist. They are called local specialists for a reason. The local and the specialist. So, Thanks to Sergei, by the way, he deserves the credit. I managed to get closer and closer and closer until I got the frame I wanted, which is this one. OK, and here you see Kamchatka, for me, Kamchatka in one frame, showing the bear, mother, and cub, the volcano in the background, the lenticular clouds in the sky, the lake, and even a salmon breaching the water behind them in the perfect framing. OK, so I can tell you that everything was planned except for the salmon. That was pure luck. And again, I don't have a problem with luck. OK, I'm fine with it. But I knew what I wanted to get. I even drew it beforehand. I showed Sergei, because he doesn't speak a lot of English. I want this, Yakachueta. OK, and he helped me get it. 
Okay? Always trust the local specialist. And then I told Sergey, I want closer. Sergey said, this will be an image of a lifetime. The last image. <laughs> okay? So I, I listened to the local specialist, and he said, don't go any closer. It's dangerous. Okay? But I'm persistent. So I got a remote trigger. A remote trigger. I placed one on the camera, one I had with me in my pocket. I placed the camera uh, in, the, in the scene I wanted to photograph. And here you see the, the client's cameras, uh, the ones I was uh, guiding. I was guiding, I was guiding a group and all of my expeditions and guiding groups. Um, so you can see my camera, one of the client's cameras, and we have the scene. And all we have to do now is wait for the main actor to come on stage. <laughs> And when, the, when it does, when she does, actually, all I have to do is click. So that's a lot closer. That's with a 14 to 24 millimeter lens, f2.8 Nikon. OK? But I wanted to get even closer. And observing the bears, I understood that if I place my camera on the shores of the lake, since the bears are walking right on the shore, on the, right on the shoreline, It'll have to, the bear will have to go over the camera. Okay, hopefully not knocking it over. Okay, so I did. I placed my camera on the shores of the lake. And what I got is exactly what I wanted. Okay? So it takes planning, persistence, of course, local knowledge. You can't ignore that. That's crucial in order to get this close. Another example is here. OK, you see the black bear, and you see me over there photographing the black bear. So black bears are less dangerous than brown bears. Like, again, don't try this at home. Uh, so that's a spirit bear, a Kermode bear in BC, in British Columbia. And I got the image I wanted, which is, again, wide and close up. Sometimes it's not that I'm afraid of the animal as much as the animal is skittish of people. OK, shy. We say shy. So in this case, I was photographing a project with the Moscow University of the Saiga antelope in Russia, South Russia, near Kazakhstan. OK? And the Saiga antelope is a very sad story. The Saiga antelope went, within the last 30 years, from least concerned in the IUCN, the red list, to critically endangered which is crazy if you think of it. So this antelope is very afraid of people because it was hunted almost to extinction. So in order to get the close-ups I'd like to get, I had to place my camera here on, with a remote trigger again. I went into hiding. I went into a hide, to a camouflaged hide, which is basically a wooden box in a 110 degree Fahrenheit weather, which inside the box was even crazier. I can tell you, I was inside the box for uh, 14 hours. Okay, I drank over. Uh, I drank about two gallons of water, but there was no toilet. I didn't even have to go <laughs> because I was drinking. It was evaporating from my skin immediately. Okay, it was that hot. But again, I got what I wanted, which is this guy. Without the triggers, I could never get it. So let's talk a little bit about photography gear. Again, you can't be at B&H without talking about gear. So my photography gear is a big part of what I do. I'm also I'm, I'm sponsored by Nikon. I'm a JITSO Global Ambassador, G Technology Ambassador, and also I'm a DJI content partner. So I'm getting a lot of gear <laughs> from these companies. So I can't say that uh, um, I, I invested a lot in gear. But I do a lot of partnership. I'm also doing a lot of reviews of I'm beta testing lenses. Uh, you can see my review. And you know the website DP Review and Petapixel? OK, so I write reviews on lenses before they're being announced 
on these websites. So you can read my field reviews on those websites. Only Nikon or? Uh, on, only Nikon, yeah, only Nikon. Uh, we have an amazing partnership, and they have great gear, and I'm not biased at all. OK. <laughs> Hardly, yeah. So uh, that's the way my camera bag looks before I pack it. OK, so I have a lot of gear. Um, and if you ask uh, the people at the airport, it's not overweight. I just hide it. <laughs> OK, and I never let them weigh my bag. Otherwise, they, they don't like it, to be honest. So I just keep it with someone else. I come to the checking office, and that's it. It's easy. OK, so that's the way my bag looks before I pack it. I'm using uh, Jitsu tripods, uh, DJI drones, and a lot of lenses. The lenses I take are depending on the project. Some projects, are like Svalbard with polar bears, I'm using the 800 millimeter f5.6. Some projects I'm using the f500 5.6, the new one, the PF lens, which is very light. I'm using the 180 to 400 f4, uh, all the range, you can say. And also underwater housing. And yeah, that's it, a lot. Part of my gear today is a drone. I never go on expeditions without a drone, OK? A drone is like having a helicopter in your backpack. And then instead of looking at the landscape like this, you can see it from a whole new angle, OK? So we, we became good friends, uh, me and the drones. I've been flying them since 2014, 2015, which was still in the basic and the beginning of drone photography. And this is when I took it for the first time to Svalbard in, in the high Arctic. And when I flew my drone there, everything looked different. Suddenly it looked some, like something from uh, Game of Thrones, the TV show. You know that TV series, Game of Thrones? So it looks like something like that. Suddenly everything looks unique. It looks special. Like this forest. I photographed in BC, in British Columbia, and the Great Bear Rainforest. And here, what I liked about this image, you see the yin and yang kind of uh, shape with the healthy forest and the sick forest behind it. I took my drone to Kamchatka. And of course, also bear in mind, in a lot of the places and a lot of the reserves, you have to have special permits. So I'm shooting with special permits, OK? And not everywhere it's legal to fly the drones, and that's a good thing, because otherwise there would be chaos, and people would be harassing the animals, OK? So there are permits that you need to obtain before flying in nature reserves, and sometimes even permits don't help, and you can't fly. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, so I was flying the drone in Kamchatka, in Lake Kuril. And this is the, en the entrance uh, river to the lake. And that's where millions of sockeye salmon come upstream to spawn. Uh, so I flew the drone over the salmon, and it looks like this. Yeah, that's a lot of sushi. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, man, it would be cool if I photographed a bear inside of all that salmon. So I did. OK? I was in Ruskaya Buchta. It's a bay in Russia. And I photographed orcas with the drone because the catamaran wasn't fast enough to follow the orcas. The orcas can swim so fast. And now I'm going to show you a short video I shot in Kamchatka. Some of it is from the ground, and some is aerial with the drone. So let's have a look.
I love Kamchatka. It, it, anyone been there? No one. Ah, it's amazing. Okay, but you have Alaska and you have so much bears here. Yeah. So a lot, this least sexy part of wildlife photography is the preparation. Some projects that you've seen here took me over two years to prepare. Sometimes I had to get special permits from government. I have to write to foreign ministers, to uh, environmental minister. I have to get uh, um, universities to sponsor me. I got to get uh, inside the field and to have a local specialist which I can trust to get, to get me back alive, which is also important. Otherwise, what are the photos worth? So some of it is even getting gas or food or a communication kit or a generator. <laughs> okay, things that are not necessarily photography related, but they are project related. So uh, this project is the one, one of my favorite ones. That's in Svalbard. I've already been in Svalbard in the high Arctic already a dozen times. And every time I'm amazed by this place. So after preparing everything, getting all the gear ready, we go out in the field. And I always say no pain, no gain, no guts, no glory, OK? But in this photo, although it looks like I'm having fun, I'm pretty cold. OK, not New York cold, but really cold, <laughs> OK? I can't feel my nose. I have uh, some frostbite on my nose. I can't feel my hands, my legs, OK? I miss home. I miss unfrozen water, <laughs> OK? Uh, so that's how I looked like at the beginning of my project there. Now I learned something. I learned that there is no such thing as cold. There is underdressed. <laughs> OK? So if you're dressed good enough, you're not cold. And that's how I look now when I'm there now. OK, so that's me. I know it can be anyone, but that's me. Uh, by the way, the funniest thing about this photo is that I'm smiling, <laughs> OK? Because it's a selfie, so you have to smile. I don't know why I'm smiling, but yeah. So that's the way I look now. And the next image I'm going to show you is one from last May. So that's what I did last May. And although I'm covered with a lot of snow and ice, I'm not cold. This was a blizzard from hell. It was a whiteout. We couldn't see for more than 10 feet away. I was afraid driving the snowmobile. I, I drive thousands of miles every year in snowmobile. I was afraid to drive the snowmobile because you couldn't see where you're going. Uh, my, my windshield flew off the snowmobile because of the strong wind. Okay? The hand warmers on the snowmobile stopped working. Okay? So no windshield, no hand warmers, but I'm still fine. So the key thing is to be dressed properly. Because if you are too cold to perform, you won't perform well. You won't get the photos you want. So what does gloves have anything to do with wildlife photography? The answer is a lot. OK, so be ready with gear, not just photography gear. So I'm there. I'm there to photograph the bears. Here are some people I'm guiding in a photography workshop there. And when we find the bears, and that's also a big thing, finding the bears, but when we find the bears, we get the gear ready, and then we start shooting. And that's the fun part. That's when the adrenaline rushes. That's when the, 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 hunt, the b blood pumps in your veins, OK? But that's when you feel alive, when you're within very close distance. I won't say because it's online, but very close distance to the bears, OK? So, and of course, this is also with special permits, not just uh, you know going in the street and finding bears. But this is with special permits issued by no Norway. Uh, so I'm there, and I love what I love most about the bears is how expressive they are, and you can see how much the mother loves her cub, and how much the cub loves its mother. So they're very expressive. You can even see that the cub did something he was embarrassed of. I love to photograph these family moments when they all get together. And one of the biggest compliments any wildlife photographer can get is when animals fall asleep 
in front of me. When they fall asleep in front of me, it means they trust me with their eyes closed, literally. Okay? When somebody falls asleep in a classroom, it's not very complimenting. But animals, it's the biggest compliment there is. Okay? So when they do, be happy. Be glad they do. Okay? As cubs always do, the cubs sometimes they fight. This one was uh, the male cub was biting his sister cub. <laughs> and then the mother is pissed off. But you can't be mad at such a sweet little thing. <laughs> Look at the huge differences between the mother and cub. The mother is huge. She gave birth to these cubs five months ago. They were born in a cave in a dark winter because the sun doesn't rise over the horizon. And here they are five months old. And they have to grow. So the mother breastfeeds them. And look at those twins. How, she, how they're suckling together. And the mother must hunt. They must, she must hunt for seals because she has to gain weight. She didn't eat anything for the last five months when she was in the den breastfeeding her, breastfeeding her young cubs. So they're trying to hunt. They try to hunt seals. Here you can see the little cub, the baby, trying to hunt a seal. The mother is very skeptical in the background. And of course, it didn't succeed. But the mother is trying to hunt tirelessly. tirelessly. She never stops. She tries time after time after time, but never succeeding. So I asked Tom, my local bear specialist, uh, Tom, let's photograph this mother bear hunting a seal. And Tom said, well, the chances are not very high. They're practically zero, because no one has ever succeeded in photographing a polar bear hunting a seal through its breathing hole. OK? So that's discouraging. But that means two things. First thing, let's understand why. Why wasn't it successful? Second thing, there's another reason to go for it. Because if it was never done before, let's try to get it. OK? So that's like the Israeli chutzpah kind of thing. So we're trying to, that, to do that. So we understood why it didn't happen. And there is a lot of reasons why. I won't go through them right now. But the key factor is to be a little bit distant from the bear while she's trying to hunt, be on our knees, and be completely still and quiet, not moving an inch. Because every movement will compress the snow transmit the sound through the ice into the water. And then the seal will hear it. And then it will just go to another breathing hole, hoping not to become dinner. OK? If we scare the seal away, not only will we miss the shot that we want, but more importantly, the mother and cub won't eat after months of starvation. So we had to wait very patiently, very quietly, and nothing happens. OK, for hours. I'm starting to think that Tom is right, because he's no, he knows what he's doing. Suddenly, without any warning, at 6.49 AM, after a night of patiently waiting, when nothing happened and the sun doesn't set in the high Arctic, we heard a splash. We started clicking. I started clicking with, before even, I even knew what's going on. And I saw that the bear has caught something. She's putting it out of the water, and I can see it's a seal. OK, you can imagine my excitement. OK, I wasn't cold and I wasn't tired anymore. She grabs him firmly, gets her entire mouth over his neck, and then knock, breaks his neck, and it's all over. It was seven seconds between the first image and the last image you see here. I can tell you, tell you by the file data. OK? But that's the first image of a polar bear hunting a seal. Of course, the first thing I did is, is rush to the internet when we got back to civilization <laughs> and check, Google it. And, and indeed, I didn't see anything like that. There was other polar bears hunting seals on sea ice, but not through a breathing hole or a, or a layer. Um, 
so I'm, I'm, I, I was lucky. Okay, as, as one of the world's most famous wildlife photographer wrote me, he wrote me on Facebook on a private message. And then again, I admire the guy, he's an inspiration. He said, you are so lucky. <laughs> okay? He's been trying to do that for the last 15 years. Okay? So yeah, I, I was lucky, I admit. I, 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 it's, it's not an issue. I don't mind luck. Again, I love luck. Okay? But luck is something you create. You make your own luck, exactly. If you go out there time after time, and you stay alert, and you, be, and you stay patient, and you are prepared for everything that's going to happen, and you never give up, and you never surrender, you make your own luck. And that's a crucial thing about wildlife photography. Okay, that's how I got lucky with that lion eating a, 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 an elephant. Okay, that's how I got lucky with this. That's how I lucky with everything else. You create your own luck. So luck is something you create, and that's a big part not only of wildlife photography, but life, okay? But wildlife photography specifically. After that, and of course, actually, it was also featured in many magazines. It won several awards. It was, uh, it, it's being uh, displayed now in several natural history museums from Canada to Australia and several places in between. So, uh, yeah, luck is good, yeah. <laughs> uh, after that, of course, uh, breakfast time. Uh, so they had a takeaway for seal. It's with the, I don't know if they, if they used Seamless or not. I just found out this app, Seamless. Yeah. So uh, they're eating seal, and the, uh, the cub is sticking his tongue out, is uh, showing off his mother, and after that, he's telling his mother thanks, gratitude. The mother is resting after preparing a huge meal for the cubs, and after the food, of course, the cubs go to the playground and play, because that's how they do. We went to sleep after that, because we were super tired. We were awake for 24 hours almost. We went to sleep. We woke up, and we returned to the kill site. After a few hours, about eight, nine hours, that's all that's left. OK, you see me? I'm a, uh, with a selfie with the seal. So here you see the seal. Uh, that's the kill site. Here you can see the claws of the mother scratching the snow and ice. And then and actually the polar bears ate everything except for the flippers, because flippers are yucky. Okay? So, but they ate everything except for the flippers. Uh, those images and videos uh, got all over the world uh, from Svalbard and also into this nice BBC film, which I'm proud to be one of four photographers who worked on that film. And that film is called Snow Bears. Uh, Snow Bears, if you've seen it, it was on BBC and PBS. Uh, it's narrated by Kate Winslet, the actress uh, from the Titanic. OK, so she has good experience with ice. So <laughs> yeah, so she's narrated that film. And now I'm going to show you the preview of the film. Uh, just to be honest, all the polar bears you see in that preview, in that trailer, uh, uh, polar bears that I photographed, the seals are not mine. Uh, another photographer who worked on that film as well. Okay, just to be honest. So let's see the promo. Every 30 minutes, the seals must take a breath. And she'll be waiting. This lesson is all about patience. The female cub seems to be taking the lesson seriously. One day, she'll have her own young to feed. Her brother prefers making snowballs. is over. But it's the wrong hole. If you haven't, I recommend you watch it. Not because I'm, I did it, because it's a good film. It's good uh, uh, script, good narration, good videography by my colleagues as well, of course. Amazing guys, inspiration to me. 
and I'm happy to be a part of this project and the following projects to come. So um, now we're working on several new films. Uh, one of them you can see here some uh, raw footage which wasn't edited yet. You can see the bear searching for the female. So he's looking and he's tasting the air for pheromones until he found the female. And then he follows her for days. Okay, he waits patiently until she's ready to mate. And you can see him yawning like a, like a puppy. Okay, and she's resting and actually her hands are on her face like, let go of me, leave me alone. So he's following her until she's ready. They're doing a lot of these nice cuddly motions until they finally mate. And after they mate, uh, the male has to cool things off, doing yoga. And after the mating, the female and male walk in their separate ways and we'll never see each other again. Yeah. The female enters a sustained pregnancy state, which means the, uh, the eggs won't be um, not hatched. No. <laughs> it won't be uh, in the uterus. The pregnancy won't develop. It will be sustained until, uh, for two months until the female has enough fat for the pregnancy to evolve. If she doesn't have enough fat, the fertile eggs will, uh, will be uh, ejected, okay? Uh, if, if she can't hold the pregnancy or through the entire length. Uh, that's another polar bear in his back light. I told you, uh, we talked about light before. I photographed a baby seal moments after it was, it was born. So you see this little guy we saw it from a distance. We didn't want to disturb the mother, so we didn't approach it until it was done, until it was over. But the blood you see on the back, that's the placenta of the mother. And you see the baby here, like a sock puppet with eyes. <laughs> okay? Uh, so we were photographing this baby, and 500 feet away was an Arctic fox. And that Arctic fox, you could tell, he was after that baby seal. So for as long as we were near that baby, the fox didn't approach. But at the end of the day, we had to, to go back. We had to leave that baby seal. And the moment we drove away with our snowmobiles, the Arctic fox came by, grabbed it, and ran away. So it had a short life. Okay, He was documented, at least. <laughs> and we bought him a two hours of life window. That's another video I took last May. When you saw me with all the eyes on me, that's last May. That's another preview of the DVD as well. Uh, you see here the male, and this male actually is after a huge fight with another male for the right to mate. So you can see this guy walking, he's hurt, he's bleeding, he's broken, and that's the female. The female is walking. The male has chased it away. If it wouldn't run away, the male would kill So now the cub went on the independent way to two and a half years old. It's about time for him to leave his mother. And this is not the beginning of the mating itself. So this is the, the mating, and then the male holds on to the female and doesn't let go. So once he, once he lets go, the female gets away. Okay, that's an example how it's done. Now the female is mad at the male. And then she walks away and the male continues to follow her. So that's how it's done for a week. And the male and the female walk together. And actually this, uh, this huge male is twice the size of the female. This guy is over a thousand pounds. And the female is around 700 pounds. That's another mating, two different bites. So the video I'm doing with the Nikon D8 
the first to see it, uh, and also the people at home, you're one of the first to see this video of uh, my May expedition. Um, oops, wait. So um, here you can see the male. The male, as I said, is injured. You can see again the portrait of the tooth broken and the bleeding. Uh, the male and the female, when they walk together, so with still images versus video, I'm showing the intensity, the energy, uh, not only the composition. And of course, uh, the emotions that I talked to you before, uh, Arctic fox yawning, open wide, another one. So as you can see, wildlife photography is a lot of different things. OK, it's not just one thing. That's how I look when I travel there uh, with a snowmobile. and they, that's the group I was guiding there, and they also returned with some amazing images. In summertime, it looks different. So these are walruses I shot with a drone from above, uh, some walruses from the ground, and some walruses from underwater. So you can shoot the same subject in different angles and get different results. The, that's always interesting. So before we wrap things up, I want to tell you that photography is more than taking photos. Photography is a form of communication. Photography has a huge power, a huge power to influence people. And photography is a tool to raise awareness to critical environmental issues. And that's one of the things I've dedicated my life to. That's why I became a Greenpeace ambassador. And as the world is changing and environments are changing, photography is a tool to make a change in the other way, to protect it. So my photography goes in international media, in magazines, and TV shows, in a lot of different places to raise awareness to the environment. Uh, we launched a global Greenpeace campaign, several campaigns. I want to show you a short campaign and how my images and video are being used to raise awareness. So let's have a sneak peek at one of the Greenpeace campaigns. Such a heartwarming moment. In the middle of a very crowded, loud, and frankly quite smelly penguin colony, I spotted this sweet little family of gentle penguins enjoying their dinner together. You remember together. these guys from the frame? Yeah. And they are not the only adorable inhabitants of the Antarctic. This frozen continent, literally at the edge of the Earth, is home to seven species of penguins and some of the world's most amazing animals. Enormous whales, orcas, seals, fish, and millions of seabirds live and nest in the ice-covered waters and rocks of this huge white wilderness. Most of them feed on the tiny krill, a small shrimp-like creature, which is basically the base of the entire Antarctic ecosystem, the fuel that powers it. Sadly, Masses of krill are getting sucked up by industrial fishing vessels. It is in danger, and so does all the Antarctic sea life that depends on it. How can we protect Antarctica and its incredible inhabitants before it's too late? 
Greenpeace has launched a global campaign to create the Antarctic Sanctuary. The world's largest protected area covering 1.8 million square kilometers of ocean. The Antarctic Ocean Sanctuary will be a safe haven for penguins, whales, seals and of course the tiny krill. Let's keep this surreal looking, extremely cold, fascinatingly unpredictable and absolutely magical place protected and free of humankind's irreversible imprint. Sign our petition to save the Antarctic life. Thank you. So photography is a lot, a lot, a lot more than just taking nice photos. Photography, in my opinion, can change the world. Not just in environmental issues, but also in human issues, in news, in other fields. And it's endless because people trust what they see, not only what they hear and read. And that's the power of photography, to change people's hearts and minds. And before we wrap things up, I want to show you that animals like taking photos too. OK, like this guy, which surprised me in Tanzania. All these penguins started clicking my camera. Actually, he's a pretty good photographer. And the last thing I'm going to show you is this guy. You remember, if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I showed you the mother and two cubs that approached me. And I had to escape with the snowmobile and leave all my gear behind. And I couldn't photograph it. So the next time it happened, I learned. And I took one of the cameras with me. I didn't have the time to pick everything up. But I had one of the cameras with me, and I got this photo. <laughs> so this is a wildlife photographer. <laughs> so he's thinking of a career change. I think, I think he wonders. He's curious. Bears are really curious. I think he's curious about what are those things that people are carrying around with them so enthusiastically. So I'd like to thank you for coming here today. Thank you, everyone at home. Thank you, B&H Event Space. And uh, I really hope you enjoyed or learned some new things. And of course, you're welcome to follow on Instagram and Facebook. And if you want to join one of the expedition, feel free to contact me.